Hello, hello, everyone, and thank you for coming back to another meetup with the OWASP Nova community. I'm joined here by Abdullah and Brian Glass. Um, Brian is going to give us a talk on SAM 2.0. And just to give a little intro on Brian, um, for as long as I've known him, he has been extremely driven by metrics and uh, <laughs> Um, data. metrics and the yeah the data and numbers surrounding decision making so um, I'm really interested to hear your take on the latest changes to Sam and how you can integrate that in uh, in and improve your own security testing frameworks or security frameworks is within the company so take it away Brian thanks Hi, for joining Brad. us uh, yeah for for those of you that may not know um, my name is Brian glass I'm currently a a assistant professor of computer science at Union University. Uh, I spent close to 15 years in the AppSec world, so uh, I still do some of that. I play with it. Um, but right now, like, my favorite thing is uh, sitting in class and talking to students, and uh, they let me create my own cybersecurity degree, so that's a lot of fun, that program starting up. Um, but tonight, what I really wanted to do is I wanted to give you some insight into some of the changes that we made in SAM 2.0. And then also an example of uh, work that's ongoing that we are actually integrating SAM into a program related to election security called Rabbit V. So one of the things that we did in SAM 2 is we're looking at... Uh, the original SAM was created many years ago, so it was more in the waterfall era. And so the idea was, is in the new DevOps, Agile, and all of that, relatively new, not so new anymore, um, what's missing in the model? Like, how should we update the model? And so that's where, when I I did a intro talk to 2 at AppSet Cali at the start of this year, which really feels like five years ago now, considering how long this year's been. Uh, I had an icon in here, so but we didn't actually have an icon for that fifth element yet. And then we ended up coming up with one. Um, and I'll explain what that actually represents. But what's, what is SAM? So if you haven't run into it yet, so OAuth SAM is it stands for Software Assurance Maturity Model. Uh, it's an open framework to try and help you formulate, measure, implement a strategy for software security related to your organization. So the goal is to help you evaluate your existing practices, uh, to help build a balanced program, and then be able to demonstrate like measurable concrete improvements. Uh, so to because if you can't if you can't provide measurements and you can't measure your progress, it, we found that it's far more difficult to actually make progress within a program. So SAM tries to help with that. Uh, SAM is one of OWASP's flagship projects. Um, I work on this one and I also work on the OWASP top 10. Uh, as Ben mentioned, I kind of like to play with data and I like to try and figure out what stories data tells us. So I serve a similar role in both the top 10 team and the SAM team of trying to collect data, interpret data, produce data, um, measure things, stuff like that. So uh, SAM is, SAM's been really great. The last couple of years, uh, SAM has seen a much more of a resurgence. So the project team for SAM has definitely grown. And I put this slide in here to try and help people understand that uh, SAM especially, uh, and more projects are getting this way as well, uh, we're trying to get past more of a US-centric viewpoint that happens a lot, especially in a number of technology areas. So if you look at the different countries that the SAM team's coming from, uh, we can bring a bunch of different experiences globally into the SAM project and try and figure out what works and what's not working in their respective areas. So if you didn't have, if you hadn't worked with SAM much in the past, and sometimes even if you did, not everybody's aware of the history of SAM, uh, it was published 
back in March of 09 as OpenSAM 1.0. Um, BSIM was published in a similar time frame. Um, and from my understanding, I wasn't with SAM at the time. My understanding is it's, it was very closely related to SAM because it was basically a fork off of the early, some early open SAM work, um, which serves Sigital now Synopsis well. Um, but in after about seven years or so, technically uh, OWASP SAM is a fork of open SAM as well. Um, so open SAM hasn't formally open SAM as a project hasn't moved since the 1.0. Uh, what most people know of for SAM now is OWASP SAM. And so a bunch of us uh, got together because we realized the value that SAM had, but we also realized that it needed a bit of a reboot or a restart because it was a little stale. And so in March of 2016, we managed to produce SAM 1.1. And as we worked through um, getting things going again, we started working through SAM 1.2. We realized um, it was actually more of a change to the scoring model than we originally had in mind. So SAM 1.2 actually got named SAM 1.5 to more demonstrate the level of change that was coming into that. But the core model was still the same. Still had the same four business functions, still had the same three security activities per function. Uh, earlier this year, um, SAM 2.0 was actually released. So um, that, that's that been going for eight or ten months now. So very good. Um, one of the things, so why, why use SAM? And so sometimes we get that question. And George Box was uh, a statistician that would talk about models. And this is something that we aspire to in SAM. And he has a fairly famous quote that said, the most that can be expected from any model is that it can supply a useful approximation to reality. So all models are wrong and some are useful. And that's what we try for with SAM is we're trying to make a model that's close enough uh, and then adaptable enough to be useful to your organization. Um, because like software has essentially an infinite number of ways of arranging things, um, that makes it incredibly difficult to build a model to accommodate all of these different types of organizations with different industry verticals, different cultures, different technologies, different frameworks, different processes, and try and figure out how to abstract that to a level that all of these different combinations can actually make use of. So within SAM, there's basically four core principles. And one of them is the organization's behavior will change slowly over time. Um, there is no silver bullet quick fix three months and you're on the go, you know, no clickbait related to that. We understand that if you go to change an organization's behavior or culture, which is usually what it takes to make lasting impact for software security, it's going to take a while. Also, like I mentioned, there's no single recipe that works for everybody. Um, in some ways, I kind of wish there was because then we could write it once. And anytime somebody asks for help, I could just, you know, take a credit card, give them a uh, template and say, here you go. And your work's all done. Um, then you also the guidance related to activities from our perspective, it must be prescriptive because that's really what people come to say I'm looking for is they're looking for guidance on not just how am I doing, but what do I need to do next? Like what else should I build on? What else makes sense? How do things relate to each other? Um, and then overall, uh, we've a lot of work goes into trying to make the model not overly simplistic, but trying to stay away from a lot of complexity that would make the barrier to entry or the barrier to use of the model really difficult. We also want it to be as clear as it can and actually measurable. Because um, there's a, uh, I forget where the quote came from, but there's a quote that is really hard to improve something you can't measure. Because um, honestly, how do you know you actually improved it if you can't measure the improvement? So one of the things for Sam that we work hard on is trying to make sure that you can get credit for work you've done. 
And that plays into um, to how we do scoring in SAM. So SAM up to 1.1, um, the, ma the maturity levels have always been the same. So all the way from zero, meaning you're not really doing much, uh, to three where you have comprehensive mastery. Uh, SAM 1.1, 1 1.0 and 1.1 had a model where you had 0, 0 plus, 1, 1 plus, and so on. Um, you wouldn't get, so you could actually, so SAM breaks up activities between like maturity level 1, 2, and 3. If you did all of your activities in level 2 and all the activities in level 3, but you missed one at level 1, you would get zero plus because you hadn't even finished all of the level one activities. So we realized that um, that was kind of a problem. And the other problem was in the early SAM model, all of the questions in the questionnaire were yes and no questions. So what that meant was, is, and if you've worked in software security or software development for very long, you realize that it's almost impossible to actually have simply yes or no answers. So an example I like to use was uh, from like the um, training section. And there's a question that says, hey, do you provide role-specific training to um, people in your organization related to software development? So if you had training for developers, but not testers or project managers yet, but you wanted to, the question becomes, do you answer yes or no to that question? Because if you answer yes, then you're giving yourself way more credit than what you've actually accomplished, and you actually hurt your ability to try and build a case for budget or funding or whatever you need, resources to be able to put that training in place, to have role-specific training for testers or project managers or business analysts. If you say no, then your management can, may come back and be like, wait a minute, I thought we did budget. I thought we allocated time for the developers. Why do we have a no here? Because you've already trained a bunch of developers. So we realized that essentially the part of the problem was is you couldn't, you would either get too much credit, you couldn't get credit for what you need, had done, or that essentially we made everyone lie a little bit on most questions. So in 1.5, and this is part of the reason why it went from 1.2 to 1.5, um, in 1.5, we changed the scoring to make it a little more granular. And we also made it in the cumulative score. So we realized the original model also intended that you would have linear activities. You would accomplish all the activities at maturity one before starting any in two and so on to three. Um, but we also found that different organizations, given cultures and IT maturity, would do these activities in different orders. And we wanted to make sure they got credit for them. And the other thing we did is, rather than answering yes or no, we went to a four-level scale. So if there's a question in SAM, if you answer no, you obviously would get no credit. But in general, if you answered few or some, meaning we've piloted something or we have a little bit in different areas, then you could get a 0.2 um, points for that particular space. If you got to at least half, you would get 0.5. And if you could answer many or most so some of these questions in terms of how broad um, you have coverage for these um, activities, then you could get that full point score. And the reason why it's not straight up linear is because if you've worked in this as well, you know that it's easier to start a pilot or it's easier to get just a few apps into that um, compared to getting it accepted by the vast majority of your organization. And we also, if you notice, it says many and most, and it doesn't say all. Because again, I was trying to keep you from having to lie on when you went through SAM assessments, because it's almost impossible to actually say all for most of these things, because there's always going to be outliers. So in 1.5, the standard structure, and this has been carried over from 1.0, was that you had governance, construction, verification, and operations. So those are the four primary business functions. And within each of those business functions, you had three security practices. 
So for instance, under governance, you'd have strategy and metrics, policy and compliance, education and guidance. So um, this is more than purely the SDL. So if you think about the software development lifecycle, most of the software development lifecycle is actually between construction and verification. Um, governance is definitely outside of it. That's a bunch of stuff that supports it. Um, operations, if in any time we draw diagrams of software development, operations becomes either nothing on that diagram or it's this little box that says support, um, which sometimes is actually more effort than the whole rest of the project. So we sat down and we looked at this because um, this was built more in the waterfall era. Um, and we thought through like, what is missing from this? So um, out of curiosity, you know, looking at this, so we have governance and we have construction and then we have verification and then we have operations. So does anybody have an idea um, what might be missing from this? Like what part of software development is not actually represented here? Wait a minute if somebody wants to try. So there was something back in waterfall days that we just assumed people did. There wasn't a lot around it. You just did something. And it wasn't actually represented in the model, in the 1.0 model. Uh, nobody's going to guess. All right. Uh, it, it's actually, yeah, so Brian's got part of it. It's build. It's actually write the code um, and all the stuff around that. So it used to be in Waterfall, you had everything to the left. Uh, construction was everything before you wrote any code. And verification was everything after you wrote code. But the gap was in the middle of you write code. And that was just it, because that's what you did. Um, for 2.0, we tried to say, look, we need to try and figure out how to make this model still work if you're using Waterfall, because there are still valid uses for Waterfall, and there's still a lot of organizations and groups that use Waterfall um, globally. The US may not see as much of it, but you also have to remember on a global scale, there's still a good bit of Waterfall development around the world. So we realized it's like, well, construction kind of implies building uh, or coding, but it doesn't really have any activities related to that. So we went through and we said, all right, so construction is more in the design, it's the pre-coding phase. So we built out a whole implementation phase. And as we work through in terms of what things need to be put in here, <coughs> sorry, um, Every, the boxes all highlighted in red actually saw changes from SAM 1.5 to 2.0. So the entire implementation business function was created. So there's stuff around how to securely build software uh, related around deployments and defect management. Um, verification had some adjustments about um, different types of testing and analysis of architecture. And operations had adjustments for some of the newer stuff um, that we've been running into. So design, the only change in design is really the name. Um, uh, that's better. So, um, so that way that gives us a better coverage, uh, something that's more related to agile uh, DevOps like uh, within the details there. So, so far over the last eight months or so, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback um, that it's more closely aligning to what people are doing. So if you break down, the other change that we made is in the 1.0 through 1.5, there were um, different activities or within the security practices themselves. Some of those activities didn't really build on each other. They could be like six different activities that were loosely related based on the overall practice, but they didn't build. So one of the changes we also made in version two is we have what we call streams. 
So there's two primary streams for each of the security practices. And they, they're more aligned to building up. As you move down the stream, you're building up maturity in that space and maturity in that area. So now we talk about things related to build process and software dependencies, uh, defect tracking, and then going into metrics and feedback. Talk about baselines, um, more of the deeper understanding, and this is more of the... Uh, targeted pen testing, more of the human base to try and get stuff that are deeper uh, and so on down that line. So this is trying to pick up and make sure we are properly modeling um, some of the changes within development that we've been seeing. So this is a question I get a lot is, can SAM map to BSIM? So we went through and we went back and looked and people have been trying to maintain a mapping loosely between SAM categories and BSIM categories. Um, you can see that they're very similar to each other in a lot of respects. So you have strategy and metrics, policy and compliance, education and guidance. BSIM has strategy and metrics, compliance and policy training. They're very similar to each other, at least at the highest level, um, partially because they had very similar origins. So I for, I put a question mark here. I forget which BSIM picture this came from. Um, it's either eight or nine. I don't remember which one. Um, but then SAM 1.5, we still both had the same four primary functions and three activities within or three practice areas within each function. If you dove down deeper than that and you started to get into the details, then you would realize that they're starting to um, separate from each other. Over time, each year, BSIM um, records what's going on in um, large companies and they, in terms of what types of activities they're doing. And so that slowly drifted away from the model that Sam had that had say, stayed fairly static for a while. So at a, again, at a high level, you can pretty much map them um, as long as you don't get into a super level of detail. And then it gets more interesting when we get into SAM version 2. The SAM version 2, we kind of broke the mold of the 4x3 setup. So BSIM 11 that was just released um, has some more changes under the hood, but they're still held to the four primary function areas with three primary practices. Whereas SAM now has a total of 15 instead of 12. Um, this graph actually has 17 because some of the work I was doing in Rabbit V that I'll show you that was starting, that was including at least for their purposes, accessibility and usability in, along with everything else. But I'm actually got, I've had a few people ask for it. So I'm actually working on just a short page or two uh, comparison between where BSIM has gone and where SAM is right now as well. Um, so the one other thing related to the core SAM project that I wanted to cover as well is what's called SAM benchmark. So similarly related to one of the primary questions that we get from SAM is like, how do I compare? Um, like, not only how do I compare against the model, but how do I compare against other people that have any kind of similar similarities with me, similar size, um, similar um, team size, security team size, similar industry vertical, that kind of stuff. So we have what's called the SAM benchmark project. Um, and so this is one of the primary things I'm working on in SAM. And that is to create a place and a mechanism to be able to store data for um, companies doing SAM assessments. So right now, uh, there's a large advantage for Synopsys and BSIM because the same single organization does all of the assessments. And so it's easy for them to collect that data, aggregate it, and produce reports on it. Um, so that, And then people can measure themselves against others in the program. SAM, on the other hand, being open source, uh, there is a fairly broad way that people do SAM assessments. 
Um, some go through the questionnaire, some do it by interview and then fill out the questionnaire. Sometimes they're self-assessments, sometimes they're third-party assessments. But we have yet to be able to create or provide like this common space or a common area for people to aggregate their SAM scores so that we can start to build this knowledge base of like, how are we doing? Where are we going? Um, how do I find something that's related to me? So the goal is, is to collect data from both self-assessing organizations and consultancies. So we know there's a number of AppSec consultancies that do, um, they have service offerings to do SAM assessments. So our intent is to basically leverage OWASP's cloud infrastructure, um, limit the number of people who have access to the raw data, and then be able to give a mechanism for people to be able to provide aggregate or high level rolled up SAM data. Um, the option is too, at some point, we hope to be able to offer where if you want to manage your SAM scoring within that system, you could do that so that it would be able to generate dashboards, charts, um, graphs, that kind of stuff for you. And you could go in there and update as you completed different activities, you could say, hey, my answer to these questions has changed to this. What's my improvement in the score? So the other thing that we have is different contribution models. So not everybody wants to be known. So there's still uh, some fear related to the risk of contributing data related to SAM. Um, for third parties, who contribute data anonymously because it's related to client work that they've done. Um, you really, there's really no way to tie it back to who exactly they had performed the assessment on. Um, those are a little bit easier, but when you get into doing self-assessments, it becomes more of a challenge. And so we wanted to give companies the ability to, if you felt that it was not a high risk, then you could be list, you could be known and listed and say, hey, we use SAM internally as an implementer. Um, we've contributed our data to the data set, um, but it's not like their name is next to the data on it. It's just that it's known within, uh, you publicly say that you've contributed, but it, we're still not necessarily attaching your logo or your name to that particular data set. Because we're trying to ask for the right amount of metadata to let people do comparisons, but not enough to actually be able to identify exactly whose data it actually is. But we also have organizations that have said, um, I'm okay with trying to trust you um, to maintain that my data is there and I wanna be able to maintain it, but I'd rather you didn't publicly identify that we contribute. And that's fine, we wanna account for that too. And then a company that says, I want to be able to contribute, but if somebody gets a hold of your entire database, I don't even want our name to be in there. Uh, we want to be anonymous number 13 or something. And the downside to that is it, it's not really possible for you to come back and maintain. You could do a drop of a one-time SAM assessment, but you couldn't come back and maintain it because then it would end up being linked to somebody uh, so, and then the fourth one, which we're still debating is whether or not um, truly anonymous submissions are accepted. Uh, if we did end up sub accepting truly anonymous submissions, then we would be looking at having an option, like if you ran a report that you could exclude that data. Um, because without having somebody to verify or check with, um, if there's oddities in the data, then it's hard to, there's, there's, not the same level of trust with anonymous data submissions as there are if we know where they came from. So how does SAM relate, like how do we get into US elections uh, related to SAM? So there's a project from the Center for Internet Security, so CIS, which a lot of people know related to like benchmarks, um, requirements and guidelines, uh, best practices and such and the EAC or the Election Assistance Commission. So there's a project that was created earlier this year called the Rapid Architecture Based Election Technology Verification. So Rabbit V. So the goal of Rabbit V was to produce a flexible, rapid and cost-effective process um, for being able to verify non-voting election systems. 
so the idea was we wanted to be able to do an initial version and then sub subsequent revisions to that product. But we wanted to be able to take advantage of what we could learn about a particular project um, to try and minimize the amount of overhead and the amount of work needed while still having the level of assurance that they're doing the right things. So looking at um, the election technology space, so related to voting technology, there are some standards in place and there are some guidance related to what you should do related to technology for voting itself. There wasn't anything or hasn't been anything related to non-voting technology. So non-voting technology, by definition, is really just not voting systems. Um, so what usually gets caught, caught up in there is electronic poll books. Um, so getting you checked in at polling locations, uh, election night reporting, electronic ballot delivery, uh, other related or internet connected connected election administration technology. So stuff that's not directly related to capturing or trying to tally your votes, but all of the supporting infrastructure around it. Um, stuff that still could have an impact on at least the perception of an election, um, while maybe not actually on the, the voting um, and tabulation systems directly. So the idea with RabbitV was to try and provide an incentive for technology providers to have more robust processes to be able to have more modern architectures, um, make them more resilient, um, and then get credit for that, right? So um, to be able to slice them up into more manageable cycles uh, and then be able to have this come in place because right now, like each state has its own verification mechanism. So if you're providing that kind of technology to a bunch of different states, you can end up with a bunch of different requirements and a bunch of different tests um, and security questionnaires and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and the other idea is from election authorities, trying to give them a consistent set of information about a product security so that they don't, in theory, they wouldn't have to undertake their own um, verification process because um, hopefully they, we'd be able to build one that they could trust from a commonality. So one of the things that RabbitV laid out was a number of different activities. Um, what makes it fairly unique is it's one of the few processes that I've ever seen that actually includes a process assessment. So it's not just saying hey, you have this application, you have this technology, we're going to do a pen test, a code review, or something like that. It's all post-implementation. Um, we're looking at things in RabbitV from at a higher level. So we wanted to look at stuff that we said, hey, we're going to assess your processes. And so when they went to do that um, and did the research, they reached out to us over at Sam and saying, hey, we really like how Sam's laid out. We really don't want to build this ourselves. Can we work with you um, to get Sam integrated into our process? Because the hope is, is by being able to run, include a Sam assessment within this process, they can score the maturity uh, of a vendor's software and the vendor's processes themselves. So how likely are they to be able to generate a good, consistent app through changes? How mature are their testing? You know, how, what level can we trust it? Um, so all of that plays into, like, what's the level of assurance that they can produce higher quality, more secure products? And then that feeds into the architecture review. So there's also an architecture review and threat model part of it where we look at Apart from your process, how well was this product actually designed and architected? And then we go through, <clears throat> then we go through a claims validation, and this is more of the traditional testing in terms of you said you're doing certain things. Um, let's see the examples and implementation. So each of the prior ones, so depending on what you have in your process, that can impact what testing rules are created. 
So if you can prove that you have some good stringent testing um, and we can verify that, that it's auditable, then we may take the output from your testing and you, we don't have to do it separately. Um, similar to architecture review and through this claims verification. So one of the things um, that we worked on getting things integrated in was they wanted to not just have SAM itself. Um, so SAM was put in there mostly, almost completely whole, um, but they also wanted to factor in usability and accessibility. Um, which are definitely important factors related to both security and for being able to ensure um, voters are able to use this technology <coughs> from both aspects. So for their purposes, we actually created a sixth function um, and we called it human factors. So we'll actually score these vendors on both usability and accessibility as well um, in terms of figuring out what all we need to test for. So from my perspective, I really, I'm a real big fan of doing things this way because it's not just how well did you actually implement a system that you want to use related to non-voting election technology, but we're also looking at how did you build that system? Not just how did you design it, but even back further um, related to a process assessment, which is where SAM is like immensely helpful for, is how well are you going to do this? So if you create a system, you create a version of your product and we test it, if you make changes, how much testing do we need to do to those changes? What level of assurance do we have based on your processes um, in your architecture and design, uh, how much do we need to test for what you've changed? Um, so uh, it's it's in a pilot process. So we're hopefully around the end of this calendar year, um, the pilot will wrap up um, and then we'll move on to the next stages. But it's, it's been pretty interesting um, and exciting to watch Sam get integrated into something that like has a larger impact and has the potential to have a very large impact outside of that. So, but that was something I wanted to, to be able to share as an example, not just talking about SAM itself, but being able to show where we could actually use SAM um, for like the, the purposes that we intended it for, using it for the greater good to try and help create more secure software for more people. So um, that's, what I have right now. So if anybody has questions, um, thoughts or anything, I'm definitely open for discussions. So Ben or Abdullah, did you have anything? Yeah, I had a question for you. Yeah. So in relation to SAM 2.0, um, you know, you, you touched upon uh, DevOps and DevSecOps. So um, mm -hmm. at, at one point, and we've seen kind of, uh, models that are kind of specific to DevSecOps as well. You and I were talking about that the other day. Um, does SAM plan in future revisions to integrate that even more? Or uh, is it, are you kind of where you want to be in regards to that? So I think at least for now, um, we're probably about as deep as we want to go. Now, um, there's there's like a DevSecOps maturity model that we've looked at, and some of that's been incorporated in the SAM. Um, and it really, a lot of it has to do with also getting feedback from people using it. Uh, so SAM is kind of like the top 10 in a way that we don't, it's a baseline for people to measure against, which means you don't want to change it super frequently. Um, so, because all that does is that's, 
causes issues for when you make changes and the model changes. Now you're trying to figure out your score change, but what do I attribute it to? Do I attribute it to my change or do I attribute it to a model change? So we're sensitive to how much we change. Um, we don't just change it for the sake of changing it. Um, the other thing is, is we want to make sure that if there's a trend in a particular direction related to software development, that it's something that sticks. I don't really want to adjust the model to something that's been hot for the last six months and then it fizzles out four months after we add it to the model. Um, so we're trying to, and we also try and abstract it in a way that you can answer all the questions, you can get your score, you can be measured by the model. Whether you're using Waterfall, whether you're using Agile, whether you're using DevOps, um, that you can still use that model for you regardless of which, um, which setup. Okay, and it looks like we have a question from the chat about, um, would you just mind elaborating on the roadmaps? Uh, what does one look like, or if there's a template out there that can be used? So here, let me find let me find the something for you real quick. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things we can do, uh, I mean, two screens is almost too much sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, where's my example? So let me pull this up. So I'll give you, where we go? Here we go. Yes, that's fine. OK. Cool. So this is the, um, this is my variant for RabbitV, but it's essentially identical to the standard SAM2 toolbox other than the purple human factors parts. Um, so when we talk about building roadmaps in SAM, uh, a lot of it comes down to basically trying to map what, what would change over time. So we have uh, support for basically phase one through phase four. Um, we don't set time to those because uh, that's up to you and your organization and your cycles. You might do phases in three month cycles. You might do a phase in six month or two year or whatever. We have to leave that up to you because different organizations move at different paces. But what we set up in here is for you to be able to say this, these first few columns on the left are what you answered in the interview. So if you go to the interview, um, you have all of these different questions. So related to secure deployment, like do you ever do you use a repeatable deployment process? Are de deployment processes automated in employing security checks? And in here you can answer, like I said before, you have some level of granularity on how you can answer them. So those get pulled into the roadmap. Um, so then when you try and figure out, like, this is my score, um, it lines up on the scorecard. So we can say, hey, these are my scores. These are my overall for the different functional areas. And we say, hey, we're kind of lacking in verification. We should probably you know, look at what can we do in verification. Um, so you can go through and you can go down the verification. You can say, all right, you know, how, how am I doing in this? And then you look at what, um, what initiatives do you have within your organization right now? Can you piggyback on any of them? Is there some... DevOps initiative for automated testing as part of a CI CD pipeline. So if you have something like that, then you can say, hey, can we piggyback on this? And can we get like some security test cases or different things in here? Um, so you plan out the different activities that you try and um, build on. And then you would predict, so say I managed to, I set out a project plan and I predict that like, this is what I want to do then you can predict how I would change the answers to these questions based on what I did within this project. So what that will do is we can say, hey, we're going to put some, put a couple of projects in place. So we're going to be able to go from, uh, to answer the question, do you test applications for the correct functioning of standard security controls? Instead of saying some, 
we'd be able to answer most or all because we've managed to roll something out that's part of our build or testing pipeline. It might be part of CI CD. Um, and we'd be able to say, hey, do we consistently write and execute test scripts to verify the functionality of requirements? And we can go from some to half. So we've managed to grow the coverage that we have of that space. Then we can see like, how does our score improve? And these are color coded so you can see um, in which particular phase did you see the improvement? So if I went and changed, I said, you know what, this program will continue um, I'll continue to see the improvements. Um, the other thing to remember is when you run a multi-phase program, just because you started something in phase one doesn't mean you can't continue to see improvements in phase two, three, and four. Um, a lot of times it takes a little while and some momentum to get it built. So what this does is this lets you plan out and then you can see... Um, so then there's, you know, in phase one, now we can see, hey, if we did all of the things we hope to do in phase one, we can predict or estimate what our scores would move to. And the other thing you can see is over on this particular tab, we have the spider diagram, but we grow it out. So we can say, hey, the red is where we're at now. If we implement the programs that we're talking about for phase one, this is where we would grow to. In phase two, this is where we would grow to. So that you could say, hey, you know what? I'm okay with education and guidance at this point. I have other things that make up for it. Or we may say, you know what? We kind of feel like we have a gap here. We need to do something. And then it helps you visualize how balanced or not your program is. Um, and then you can make progress in particular areas. Cool. Have you seen a scenario where somebody you know, starts progressing and then maybe in the later phase, uh, something falls apart and they sort of move back a few steps. Uh, have you seen that? Or I, I've seen regression. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why it, it's actually supported. <laughs> you can actually downgrade yourself um, and it shows up in a red just so that you really understand what you just did there. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't get surprised by the scores. Uh, I've seen that, but it's usually been, I mean, you can do it because you've lost funding or you've lost resources. Um, I, most of the time I've seen it, and it's not been a lot. Uh, most of the time I've seen it, it's related to because they changed something out. So they've completely replaced how they did testing in a particular area, or they completely replaced the tool. So they may have had an older tool that had broad coverage, but its quality was terrible. And so they decided we need to scrap that and we're going to replace it with something that does a lot better job. But that first phase, they may only have coverage of partial. So that's also something that we've tried to work out within SAM. And it's actually ridiculously difficult to figure out is that is to measure these things in both breadth, like how many systems can you impact? How is your coverage in your company? But also depth in terms of quality. So not only am I testing all of my apps, but am I actually doing a good job at testing them? And that's the harder part of the metric to get. The harder aspect is what level of quality do I actually have in these metrics? Thank you. It uh, doesn't look like we have any more questions in the chat window. So would you mind just bringing up your information one more time, uh, Brian? Sure. Let me find it. <laughs> Here I can, if you want, I can give you a little privacy. Uh, I just got to figure out which, which window it wandered off to. Oh, there it goes. There we go. Cool. So. Yeah. So if anybody has any follow-up questions for Brian, please feel free, you know, reach out to him. Um, you can see his, his email address, his Twitter handle, all good stuff. Yeah. If, if you want to contribute to OWASP benchmark or the SAM benchmarks, please let me know. Uh, we're working on getting the system set up, but I can definitely take data beforehand. Or if you want to wait till the whole system's up, but just want to talk about it, by all means. Um, 
And I'll also slide in that um, my other project, the top 10, we're act we have the active data call until the end of November this year. So mm -hmm. if you've got data, please contribute. Uh, we're trying to make it the largest public data set for like vulnerability data um, as an aggregate. So basically the largest number of applications that we know uh, about from testing. So uh, otherwise don't complain that CSERF fell off the list. <laughs> this is your chance. <laughs> to so 2017, man. This is your chance to contribute the data from your perspective. And everyone, depending on the technologies they test and the methods they use and the tools they use, they see different perspectives of that vulnerability testing. So by all means, bring me your perspectives because I want to put them all together. All right. Well, once again, thank you, Brian. Uh, as for the rest of you, uh, we don't really have anything planned at the moment for next month, but please just... Keep in contact with us and we'll post uh, post new meetups as we plan them. So thank you everyone for joining us and I hope you all take care and stay safe. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thanks guys.